My name is Barb Flory, and I'm old, and I have arthritis. My name is John Miller, and I suffer from depression. My name is James. I am autistic. My name is Erin Umstead, and I have attention deficit disorder. When I go to church, sometimes I feel overwhelmed by all the stairs and trying to stand. When I go to church, sometimes I feel hopeful. Sometimes I feel like hiding. Sometimes I feel lonely. I wish that the church knew how it feels to be unimportant. So unimportant that your needs are ignored. I wish the church knew that sometimes I just want to engage in a conversation about my interests. I wish the church knew how many churchgoers suffer from the same problem. I wish the church knew that just because my brain is wired differently, I still can live into the plan God has for my life. Well, good morning. My name is Mikkel White. Uh, for those of you who don't know me very well, my name is Mikkel. It rhymes with Michelle, and it's spelled similar to Michael. So if you get an email from a Michael White, it's not Michael, it's Mikkel, it's me. So, all right. Yeah, yeah. All right, so someone once told me, they gave me this story. For a long time, I didn't have a name for how I felt. I felt so alone and confused, very much like a loser that no one could love. I asked God why he let me be this way. After many years, I had a breakthrough. I, I began to recognize God is walking with me, and I'm not a loser. It seems simple, but it was anything but. During a particularly dark time, a teacher from the pulpit said that there was no reason a person should have a pity party. I know they didn't mean any harm, but it helped cement this idea in me that I was alone and couldn't depend on God's help. But with some therapy and meditation and God, things have improved. I know it will never disappear completely. This is the story of someone from our church community who has depression. And depression and other mental illnesses can be disabling conditions. That's something that we don't often think about. We don't often consider mental illness or depression a disability. But... Uh, I am really, really thankful that this person was willing to trust us with this story. I hope that you hold these stories with sacred um, compassion. Maybe you've never thought about depression or mental illness as a disability. And the truth is that disability is a very hard concept to define. There's a lot that goes into the definition of disability. What's important for us to know for today is that disability is, is typically something that presents physical or social barriers for participation in a community. So if mental illness or depression keeps you from functioning in your community, from, from being part of your community, it can be a disability. It includes way more than wheelchairs, okay? We're, we're going to keep exploring these ideas together during this series because I think that the church has a lot of room to grow in how we respond to and welcome disabled people. I know that we want to be a church, that you want to be a church that loves people well, that welcomes people, that encourages people, that is inclusive. And so we're going to talk about how we can do that. We're, we're going to work to be a little less awkward, a little less fumbling. We're in week two of the series that we're calling Disability Isn't a Dirty Word. Last week, we began a conversation, and, and we talked about disability and the church. We laid a foundation. I, I, I talked some about why this is important to me. Um, we talked some about the history. Mark and I, Pastor Mark and I had a conversation. Um, I know that we live in Michigan, and the winters are hard, and so we're going to be, like, traveling over the summer. That's okay. And... I really think that you're not going to want to miss these messages. So if you are traveling, I really do encourage you to go back and watch. The messages are going to be posted on YouTube, and they'll build on each other. So if there's any time that you're like, wait, what is she talking about? I may have talked about it in a previous message. So you may want to go back and watch that one, or you can just ask me too. Uh, I'm sure we'll have lots of conversations. Today, we're going to be talking about disability theology Hopefully this will be challenging, but not so like overwhelming that you feel like shut down. I hope that this will be an invitation for you to consider thinking, uh, to continue thinking about how 
how God relates to disability. Next week, we'll discuss disability and community, which is about our need to need people. And we'll wrap up the series with disability and identity. Now, our time at Waldemar will not end with this fourth message. We're, we're going to continue uh, for one more week here at Waldemar with uh, a message on baptism. Um, and so if you're interested in baptism, I hope that you will check that off on your communication card, your connection card. It's on there. So, all right. In our first message, I introduced you to Dr. Amy Kenny. She wrote a book called My Body is Not a Prayer Request. Just think, think about that. My body is not a prayer request. By the way, if you fill out a connection card, there will be an opportunity for you to win a book. We're going to draw it today before we leave. And we have two books that are options. One of them is this book, My Body is Not a Prayer Request. And the other book is written um, by a non-Christian poet who is disabled and she reflects on disability. She's going to be here on the 23rd. So I'm just saying if you... It's worth filling out a connection card, and we're only doing the physical connection cards, so you got to fill out the paper one. All right, this week I want to introduce you to someone called Nancy Eastland. She wrote a book called The Disabled God, toward a liberatory theology of disability. So this is an academic book, um, and it's sort of like the OG book on disability theology. This is like the seminal book on, in an academic world on disability theology. Um, it's really challenging and mind-blowing, and from an academic perspective, it's, it's necessary reading. Now, we began last week by talking about some of our language, and I told you that I intentionally used identity-first language, which is that I say disabled person, okay? This is in opposition to person-first language, which is person with a disability. Now, a lot of times we get a little squeamish about saying disabled person. I went into a lot of the history about that last week. Um, the short of it is that right now, the disability communities that I am listening to express that they prefer to be called disabled person. But always, always, I defer to the person in front of me. So if I'm talking to someone, they're, they're disabled, and they say, I prefer to be called a person with a disability, that's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do. So the point is respect more than anything else. Um, but what's interesting here is that the language has changed in the last 30 years. And so Eastland, this, this author that I just referenced, she wrote her book in 1994. And so her book reflects person-first language because that was the right language at the time. So... Language changes, language shifts. We're all kind of figuring this out as we go. We're all muddling through it together, and that's okay. Um, I also use the phrase non-disabled person or non-disabled people to refer to those who don't currently have disabilities. Uh, sometimes people will say, like, uh, an able-bodied person, but, you know, there's a lot of disabilities that have nothing to do with your body and everything to do with your mind, and so non-disabled is what I tend to use. And again, I'm just giving you the rundown so you're not like caught up in my language as I go because there's a reason that I use this language. All right, one more thing. I hope this is clear, but if it's not by now, the series is not about healing. The series is not about avoiding disability by being super spiritual or something like that. Um, that's not what we're going for. Um, instead, in this series, I hope that we will... In we will all be invited to remember that every person is made in God's image. Every person is made in God's image. Another way to put it is the Imago Dei. Every person bears the Imago Dei, has the Imago Dei, which is the Latin term for image of God. When we truly believe that every person is made in God's image, we can begin to see goodness in ourselves and goodness in our sometimes ornery bodies, or bodies that give us some problems, right? Like, we, we can see goodness in that. And this can lead us to radical self-acceptance and an increased awareness. So first, radical acceptance, and second, an increased awareness of the harmful messages that shape us and the world around us. Now, radical self-acceptance is necessary. I, I want to read you something from this book. Sonia Renee Taylor wrote um, The Body is Not an Apology. And she says, 
Racism, sexism, ableism, homo and transphobia, ageism, fat phobia, are algorithms created by humans' struggle to make peace with their body. A radical self-love world is a world free from the systems of oppression that make it difficult and sometimes deadly to live in our bodies. A radical self-love world is a world that works for every body. Creating such a world is an inside-out job. How we value and honor our own bodies impacts how we value and honor the bodies of others. This means that we have to work to see and accept our bodies just as they are. We're going to talk more about this next, in the next couple of weeks when we explore how disability relates to community and identity. But you should know that this message is for you, whether you consider yourself disabled or not. This message is for all of us. There's work for all of us to do in this. And then the second part of what I mentioned is recognizing the messages that are around us that shape how we think and, and this is important because without the ability to recognize harmful messaging, we're unable to filter out those messages, right? If you can't see it, you, you can't reject it, which means that they shape us in all kinds of ways that we won't even understand or recognize. One example of this, think about James Bond movies and the villain in James Bond movies. How frequently are the James Bond villains disfigured in some way. Once you start seeing it, like it's really hard not to see it. How many villains, I mean the Wonder Woman villain uh, in the first Wonder Woman movie had a disfigured face. And the message that we're meant to receive there is that a disfigured face matches a disfigured inside. Wow, that's just not true. And if we're not able to see it, we're not able to filter it out, and those, those messages shape us. And what we want as a people of God is to see the goodness of God in other people, right? To recognize the image of God that every person bears and to love them well. So let's talk about some of these barriers that we have to doing that. Because remember, if we can't see, if we can't see the harmful messages, we can't filter them out. We need a framework to recognize them. And we're specifically going to be looking at this harmful theology, which is, you know, theology in this situation is how God relates to disability. What do we believe about God in relationship to disability? All right, so the first harmful theology we're going to talk about is that we equate sin with disability. We equate sin with disability. This perspective believes that disabled people are disabled because they did something wrong. The disability is an indicator of some kind of sin. Now, most of you probably hear that and you think, I don't believe that. And I'd say, good, I'm really glad that you recognize that that's a harmful message. And sometimes even with the best of intentions, the subconscious messages that we've received means that our impact doesn't match those intentions. And we have to work to make our impact match our intentions and we're still responsible for our impact. So let's have a little thought exercise. When you think of someone who's done everything they can to take care of themselves and their bodies, what image comes to your mind's eye? Like just, yeah, slender, right? Just think about it. Like, are they thin? Are they average? Are they fat? Can you see muscle definition? What are they physically able to do? And all of this is because they made really good choices, right? So, you know, if someone is fat or has physical limitations or other physical issues, does that mean the inverse is true? That they didn't take care of themselves? Or what if we all just come in different sizes and shapes? What if we're all just different? Here's another story. And this one is poking fun at myself a little bit. Uh, last month, my family went out to eat and we went to this little diner. And um, it's a diner we had been to before and there were booths. And so we, there's five people in my family. So my husband and one child sit on one side. I sat on the other side with two of my kids. And I noticed we were a little squished, a little bit more than the last time that we were there. And I was like, oh, we have a little less room. 
And one of my kids pats me on the back and says, it's because your butt got bigger, mom. <laughs> and, and what is your internal reaction to that? You feel embarrassed for me. But why? Why is it a bad thing if, if my butt got bigger, if my body grew? Why is that bad? Why, why do we feel the need to hush that child and correct them? Now, in general, it's probably not great to comment on people's bodies. I, that's in general true. But for a child to notice that and say that, that doesn't embarrass me. They're just commenting on something that happened. Now, what, what would happen if we could accept that the image of God is reflected in fat bodies and paralyzed bodies and thin bodies and active bodies and every body of every kind? How would that change how we, how we move through the world? Now, this is really tough to do. And, and the messages that have shaped this idea that we have, they go back a long, long way. You could look at some places in Leviticus, which is a book of laws in the Old Testament. In chapter 21, the book says that the Lord told Moses who could and could not offer sacrifices in the most holy place. Guess who wasn't worthy? It was anyone who had a physical disability. People who were blind, disabled, disfigured. The, the list is actually pretty extensive. Um, and they were deemed unworthy. Their bodies were not welcome to participate in that religious ritual. Now, truthfully, I don't understand this instruction. There are a lot of Old Testament laws that I can look at and I can kind of make sense of, like, okay, well, it made sense with, like, food preparation or it made sense with their idea of blah, blah, blah. This one is one that I struggle with. I don't really get it. I don't understand the purpose behind it. I'm thankful that Jesus later challenges this idea of disability. And I, I would argue that much of how he interacts with disabled people, even in his healing of them, indicates that he was more concerned to heal their connection to the community than he was to heal their physical bodies. He was more concerned to heal their connection with the community than he was to heal their physical bodies. We talked about John 9 last week, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time uh, on this. And in fact, we're going to talk about this passage a few more times during the series. But it's the story of where Jesus' disciples see a man who's blind. And they ask Jesus whether the blind man or the blind man's parents sinned that he was born blind. You see that? They're equating sin and disability. Jesus says neither. He's blind to reveal God's glory. And after the man is healed, we see how he still struggles to connect with his community. The religious leaders call him in and they're like, how are you healed? Why were you healed on the Sabbath? Who healed you? And they are interrogating him. They don't like his answers. So then they call in his parents. They don't like their answers. And so they call him back. I mean, it's this whole thing. And it's at the end of the story that he understands who Jesus is. And in following Jesus, he finds freedom from the things that were keeping him from worshiping with his community. In so many places, sin is equated with, it's conflated with, made synonymous with disability. All right, so last week I gave you an out on the chat question. We're going to bring it back. But I'm, I'm going to give you an out, right? So this is going to be like a choose-your-own-adventure chat question just so that we can come up for air. Option one, why do you think God allows people to have disabilities? How do you make sense of that? Talk about how, how to make sense of that. The other option, if you're not ready to go that deep, is to talk about how you celebrated the 4th of July, okay? <laughs> so we're just going to take a minute and a half. We're going to come up for air, and then we're going we're gonna to jump back in, okay? All right, take a minute. All right, so I expect that you have solved all the world's problems and planned your celebration for next year. Now, if, if you want to know, like, a $10 academic word for that question about disabilities, it's theodicy. Theodicy is an attempt to resolve how God is all good, all powerful, and all knowing, even when people are suffering. So if this is a question that intrigues you and you're looking at a book and it, it says theodicy, that's what it's talking about. 
I find this question difficult and fascinating and so relevant to so many of our experiences. How does God let suffering happen? Now, that actually brings us to our second harmful theology about disability, suffering does, which is virtuous suffering. For this idea, think about how we discuss Job. Job, he's the guy in the Old Testament, and, and God and Satan kind of get together, which is weird, or Satan goes to God or something, and they single out Job. God gives Satan permission to torture Job, and Satan just goes to town. I mean, he, so many bad things happen. Job's children dies, die, his camels die, his ox die, his slaves, like his servants die, like every, all the things die. And then he, he suffers a physical disability, at least temporarily. He's got sores and boils all over his body. This would have been one of those things that would have kept him from serving the temple. I mean, if he was one of the right people to serve, whatever. You, you get what I'm saying? That was one in that list. Um, his, his friends are just awful. But Job is virtuous. Job perseveres. Job refuses to curse God. He continues to trust God. He's virtuous in all of his suffering. And what happens? At the end of the story, he gets everything back. I mean, I'm always trying, like... The people who die don't come back to life, but he has new kids. He has, his, his uh, livestock are returned to him. Like his estate grows bigger than it was before. All he had to do was persevere. Yikes, right? The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Or, or take Paul in the New Testament. Writing to a church in Corinth, he describes his qualifications for teaching the, the church. And this is what he says. Even though if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth. I refrain. So no one will think of me more than is warranted or by what I do or say or because of these surpassingly great revelations. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You guys, he literally attributes whatever this is, this thorn in his side, which we don't really know what it is, but it's some kind of physical thing. It's a thorn in his side, right? To keep him from becoming conceited. To keep him from becoming too arrogant, he was given a disability. And so then, therefore, he says, I'm going to delight in this. Because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Now, Nancy Eastland says this about Job and Paul. They represent disability as a temporary affliction that must be endured to gain heavenly rewards. This is a message that often seeps in to our subconsciouses, right? We, we start to, to believe that that we just have to endure, and then everything will go away. If I can put on the right face, if I can make this work, I'll be all right. We have to be really, really careful about how we talk about this. Because if we aren't, then we send the message that people simply ought to adjust to suffering, to accept unjust social situations, accept isolation. This perspective encourages resignation to uh, resignation as the appropriate response to divine testing. We, 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 in the question of theodicy, we say, God caused this to happen to teach you a lesson. You just got to learn the lesson and it will go away. We encourage people to accept barriers to inclusion. And then we get to congratulate ourselves. Aren't we so great? We removed those barriers when like, maybe that ought to be like the low bar, right? Like, like that ought to be like baseline level. Now, the thing is, when we view suffering as a means of purification, 
as a means of becoming more holy, then we unintentionally reinforce the idea that there's a link between sin and disability. And that those who never experience a cure, who never experience some kind of miraculous healing, must actually be hiding some kind of sin. In many ways, in many parts of the Big C Church, this plays out in the way that women, so this is not about disability, but this is about gender equity, like in women are encouraged to accept a second-class status of helpers of men. And we've emphasized to them a practice of self-sacrifice as a sign of obedience to God. It's the same kind of idea there. And and anytime we act as if the image of God is shadowed over, is dimmed in certain bodies, we marginalize them and we cause harm. We hide the goodness of God in other people. I hope that we can all agree that this is harmful. This, This is harmful, especially when it's wielded against those who already experience marginalization in our societies. All right, so the third one. Third, harmful theology about disability is segregationist charity. All right, so this one is a little difficult to talk about. It's a little difficult to explain because on one hand, the charity of the church has done a lot of good. It's done a lot of good. Really, from the first century of the common era, the church has been part of caring for people who were discarded by society. Hospitals and orphanages were developed because followers of Jesus decided that people should be cared for instead of being forgotten. That's really good. That's really, really good. The benefits of charitable organizations shouldn't be underemphasized. And one unintended result of the practices of some of these charitable organizations has been the segregation of disabled people from our society and from the Christian community, rather than the restoration of people to our religious and our social life, right? Disabled people have been kept separate from the Christian community instead of fully included. Now, this happens when orphanages keep children in an institution rather than putting them in families. This happens when people are placed, disabled people are placed in institutions rather than their families being given the resources they need to care for them at home, right? That's how this plays out. And the thing is that we want so badly to love people. I really believe that about us. We want to love people. We want to do better. And the truth is that a lot of us are still uncomfortable around disabled people. Remember the statistic that we learned last week? 67% of people are uncomfortable talking to a disabled person. And so we we have this tension in us. We want to feel, we want to love people, and we feel uncomfortable. And so how, how do we resolve this? Well, sometimes, instead of doing that deep work of dealing with our uncomfortableness and asking ourselves, why do I feel uncomfortable? We, we look for ways to love people from a distance. And so we give money to that organization over there. Or, or we send things, resources over there rather than making our own communities accessible. And I, I think we, say, we, we see that in that way, right? Um, where we send our resources over there. But the second way that's a little bit more, I'd say insidious, is it, like tricky, it happens by accident, it is a sort of patronizing way that we include disabled people, right? And so this, this can happen like, Yeah, when we give someone a public but relatively unimportant role that makes us feel good about including without really doing a work of learning from the person or allowing them to to speak and reflect God back to us, right? There's so much there. And again, I want to reiterate, I see the good intentions. We all want this so badly. I know that our actions come from a desire to love people well. And we should challenge ourselves to examine whatever distance there might be from our intentions and our impact and bring those closer together. Eastland challenges us. In order for the Christian church to stop doing harm and to move toward being more just, it must pay careful attention to the theology of disability as an integral part of its movement. 
This theology must be made a visible and ordinary part of the Christian life and our reflections on our lives. So right now we primarily see disability as a fate to be, dis to be avoided, a tragedy to be explained or a cause to be championed. But I know we wanna do better. We, we wanna do good, to do no harm, to stay in love with God. What if disability is an ordinary life to be lived? What if it's an ordinary life to be lived? How, how do we move toward that liberatory, like a uh, liberation theology around disability? We can shift our understanding of who Jesus is, shift our understanding of what perfect bodily resurrection means. Eastland challenges us to change our entire paradigm for understanding how we participate in this body of Christ, in our religious community. And this involves seeing God in a new way so that we can see ourselves in a new way. This involves seeing God as the disabled God. In Luke's account of Jesus' life and ministry, he, he records a story about Jesus' resurrection. After Jesus was crucified on the cross, his hands and feet nailed to the cross, his side pierced, he's buried. Three days later, the women go to the tomb to care for his dead body, and they find the tomb empty. He's not dead after all. Now the men don't believe the women's account, but that doesn't change the fact that it was true. Uh, a few days later, Jesus appears among the disciples who are discussing more reports of Jesus' resurrection. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself, touch and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Have you ever heard someone say, like, when we die and go to heaven, our scars will be gone, we'll be perfect? Have you ever heard somebody say that? I know I have. I've heard that a bunch. It's interesting what happens when I consider that idea. What comes to my mind's eye what do I imagine? Who do I imagine is there? Do I imagine wheelchairs in heaven? Do I imagine scars? Do I imagine smooth complexions? Or does anybody still have acne? I don't know. What, what comes to our minds when we consider that? Then consider how Jesus appears to his disciples. He invites them to look at his hands and his feet where the scars were. In another account, he invites Thomas, the one who doubted, to place his hand in Jesus' side where he had been pierced. This is Jesus, scarred. He's scarred. Eastland says, in the resurrected Jesus Christ, they saw not the suffering servant for whom the last and most important word was tragedy and sin, but the disabled God who embody both impaired hands and feet and pierced side and the imago Dei, the image of God. Jesus calls for his disciples to recognize in the marks of, their, of his impairment their own connection to God, their Savior. The disabled God is not only the one from heaven, but the revelation of true personhood underscoring the reality that full personhood is fully compatible with the experience of disability. Full personhood is fully compatible with the experience of disability. And the implications of this are truly astounding. The disabled God does not move in a battle for power or dominance. This God is located at the margins and initiates transformation from that location. Our bodies participate in the Imago Dei, not despite our impairments or our limitations or our contingencies, but through them, through our impairments. What, what impairments do you have? What limitations do you have? Could those be your connection to participate in the image of God? Not something to be eradicated, but something 
that gives you a connection to God. The resurrected Jesus challenges the urge that we have to physically avoid disability and calls for followers of all abilities and disabilities to recognize their connection and equality at the point of Christ's physical impairment. The disabled God embodies the ability to see clearly the complexity of the mixed blessing of our bodies without living in despair. So you can acknowledge, gosh, sometimes life is hard. Sometimes disability is hard. Sometimes living in this body is difficult. And still, God is good. And still, living is good. This movement isn't one that pretends that all bodies are easy to live with doesn't negate the challenges that many of us have in our bodies, but we we can accept that mixed blessing without living in despair. The disabled God is God for whom interdependence, that need to rely on each other, we're going to talk about that more next week, is not a possibility to be willed from a position of power. Interdependence isn't like a fun thought experiment. It is necessary for life. Take a moment to let that sink in. The resurrection of Jesus is not about erasing the things in us that are imperfect or broken or disabled, but rather the resurrection offers hope that matter, no matter what kind of body you have, you participate in the image of God. You have the image of God. One of the ways that we participate in remembering this and reminding each other of this truth is through communion which you might sometimes hear referred to as the Eucharist. Communion is a place where we come together as the body of Christ. And we're going to talk more about this next week, about what it means to be a community, to be the body of Christ. But for now, consider this. When we embody Christ as the church, we embody a disabled God. We are scarred people. We are sometimes difficult to live with. We sometimes cause pain that we don't know where it comes from. This is what it means to embody Christ as the church. Easton says the Eucharist as body practice signifies solidarity and reconciliation. God among humankind, the temporarily able-bodied with people with disabilities and we, we ourselves with our own bodies. In the Eucharist, we encounter the disabled God who displayed the signs of disability, not as a demonstration of failure and defect, but in affirmation to connection and strength. In this resurrected Christ, the non-conventional body is recognized as sacrament. The non-conventional body is recognized as sacrament, as holy. When we receive communion together, a few things happen. First, We ought to be motivated, right, to remove any physical barriers that would keep a person from participating in communion. We should look toward other barriers, physical and social, that might prevent or inhibit marginalized people from accessing the table. And second, we're joined together as the body of Christ. In all of our communities' imperfections, we remember that we are one even as we are scarred. Third, we find peace in our own bodies, in our limits, in our imperfections, in our neediness, because it is through the messiness of our humanity that we connect most closely with Jesus, our disabled God. 